historically, people have stayed in their homes for about 8.1 years. I have a sneaky suspicion in a decade that's going to average 12 or 13 years. We're actually going to have people pay off their mortgage, Jason. That's going to happen. 42% of the country has no mortgage already. Mm -hmm. The interesting thing about it, too, is we're in this strange market where housing affordability is so low. And I saw this when I lived in Newport Beach, California. You have a very rich area. You have all these rich people, okay? And what was interesting about that is it's an area where, like, no new blood comes in. Because right. nobody would relocate there hardly because it's just too expensive. Okay, so if you're moving from, you know, Phoenix or Minneapolis or wherever or Atlanta or Dallas, you know, it's just way too expensive to move to Newport Beach, right? So, so you would have this sort of the, like, you, it'd be the same people that would just hang out there for decades and decades. And the real estate industry was comprised largely of people who already owned a home had a lot of equity and were selling that home to buy another home. And so right. housing affordability didn't matter to them very much because they weren't impacted by an affordability. They were trading a large chunk of equity into a more expensive property where, you know, maybe the mortgage was the same or it got a little bit bigger. Well, that's, that's the wrinkle. That's the yeah. wrinkle. We had 40 years of falling rates. So if you happen to be in Newport Beach and had all that appreciation, you could trade up in Newport Beach and probably keep your payment right about the same. Yeah. That is not the case today. If you're a move up buyer today in Newport Beach, you're going to go from a 3% mortgage to a slightly bigger house at 8%. That math doesn't work. And that's why everybody's going to age in place. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you a funny thing about that. I remember talking to my friend Rick one day, and I, I was, at the time, I was not in a relationship. I was single. And I said, hey, you know, Rick, what happened around here? You know, years ago, there used to be all these cute 25-year-old girls here. And he said, well, Jason, they're all still here. They're just 45 now. <laughs> <laughs> I think that explained the real estate market really well. <laughs> yeah. So it's, uh, it's interesting. So what else does this say about what we can expect and what we should do as investors, as homeowners? Well, to me, uh, investors is obviously where I focus. To yeah. me, this means the real estate market's slowing down. I actually think we're going to go into a deep freeze, but I want people to hear this. Is, I so, actually, so will, will transaction volume get even lower? Yeah, I think it's going to go to 3.75 to 3.8. It's going to go down about another 5%. Okay, in so 3.75 to 3.8 million transactions Units. per year. Right. Correct. Okay. But what that's going to mean is it's going to be easier to find motivated sellers. And my job as an investor is to deploy capital that produces an above average yield or cash on cash return. And I'm looking to do that going forward. There's going to be more motivated sellers. Death, divorce still happens. Job transfers still happen. And if the house isn't perfect, I won't pass an inspection. You're going to need you're going to need a buyer like me to come in and um, I'm going to offer a lower price. So I'm, you know, I'm going I'm to be aggressive. Sure I, I'm not sure I agree with you on that. I don't think there's going awesome. to be a lot of motivated sellers. I think you're going to have this constricted inventory that's going to make it unnecessary for those people to become motivated. Mm -hmm. Of course, there's always going to be some. Right. right. No question. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the analysis I want to do, and I've been thinking about this for a while now, I want to do an analysis on rentals. Okay. So mm. go back to your chart for a moment. Can you pull up your spreadsheet sure. again? Let's of course. look at transaction volume, because this is something I've been thinking about lately. And let's look at volume in recent years. Okay. So okay. let's just recent years. go Scroll. to you know the last five years or so. Okay. So row seven. So here, wow. When, when did we do 8.4 million transactions? I, I didn't, I never knew it got that high. Uh, well, that's the min max. What year was that? It's probably in the bubble. Yeah. 2005. Wow. We did 1.2 million 9. new. Yeah. Wow, that's incredible. And that's why we had such an inventory hangover. <laughs> yeah. People don't realize the amount of building that was going on in the 0405 versus yeah. today. It's wildly yeah. different. I know today there's like no building. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. So let's just consider this for a moment. Let's talk about renters in the rental market. Okay. Sure. So you have volume that has declined dramatically. Do you have any stats here on the first time buyer percentage of the market? 
I do not. No, that's not okay. on the spreadsheet, okay. but can but, be added. Yeah, I'm going to call that somewhere generally in the 25% range. Is that a fair statement, do you think? I would have guessed a historical average is more like 20, but yeah, if you want to call 25 on the rosy side, sure. Okay, so let's assume that 25% of the buyers are first-time buyers, okay? okay? So they are currently renting, and then they buy their first home. Now, let's look at, for example, your 2019 number, 6 million transactions. Okay. okay. So 6 million, I'm pulling up my calculator right now. And let's take what we've got. You, you think it's going to be, what's it, what is it now seasonally adjusted? Today is 3.96 okay. was the last read. So 4 million, I was going to say 4 million. So, so we've okay. got 2 million transactions. Okay. This is easier. I don't need a calculator. 2 million transaction deficit. Okay. Right. That's a deficit. And I'm not taking the COVID era. I'm going 2019 to give it a more idea. even flow, right? Yep. That's a more reasonable number because during COVID, it went above that uh, quite dramatically Correct. actually in 2021. We take 25% of that. That's 500,000 people that are trapped in the rental market. And getting worse. Yes. I want you to think what that does to rents people. That puts upward pressure on rent like you won't believe. Now, this is a little bit unnoticeable right now because people are getting fooled by headlines. One of the headlines is rents are decelerating. That's Correct. true. They have been decelerating. That's not declining. It just mm -hmm. means accelerating more slowly. Okay. It doesn't mean decline. It doesn't right. mean stopping. But you have this massive amount of new inventory of apartments that have hit the market. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that's in a little bit of a bubble. It's going to take, you know, two, three years to work itself out. But if we see consistently lower sales volume and we call a quarter of that market to be first time buyers that are right. now trapped in the rental market, folks, I've been saying for a long time, rents are too damn low. And I know everybody thinks I'm crazy saying that, but look, now you're starting to see all these articles that say it's a better deal to rent than buy. And I think few mm -hmm. people would disagree with that. Sure. And whenever it's a better deal to rent than buy, that automatically means the rents are going to start inching up. Okay. And, and we are going to see dramatically higher rents in the future. And then the uninformed people will say, well, Jason, Michael, come on, people can't afford it. Well, what gives? What gives is their expectation. They just get less. Yeah, that's they get the less. Reality exactly. of it. They just accept less, and Correct. that's that's what happens when you have bad fiscal and monetary policy and mm -hmm. uh, a messed up, dysfunctional housing market, which is what we have. I mean, yeah, it's, it, no, I mean the housing market is clearly broken. Coming into this analysis, I now think it will be broken for five to ten years. You take this to the first time home buyer, we're down 500,000 year one. Then there's year two, year three. If the market really is broken for a decade, we could, we could have four or five million first time home buyers trapped as renters into a falling supply. Because also, what's going on right now is builders are pulling back monstrously. So yeah. I think shelter inflation is rolling over just the way they calculate it. Uh -huh. But I actually, this morning on the Daily Financial News, said I think shelter inflation goes up next summer. Because the supply is just not going to be there. Right. Absolutely. In your very comprehensive spreadsheet, do you have the homeownership rate in here? I do. Very top oh. row, row two. Okay. Okay. So that's row two. Okay. So go back to you know the seventies where you started here. I want to look at these numbers. Okay. So nineteen seventy homeownership rate was about what it is now, sixty four percent. Yeah, okay, it's a pretty tight band. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And then by 86, it got to like 63%, went down a little bit. Now let's go uh, up more. It's pretty tight. It's a pretty tight band. Yeah. Yeah. It got 1996. It was 65%, 2001, 67%. And here's that George here's Bush the bubble. era of the ownership yep. society coming in folks that led to the bubble. Yeah. 2004, um, I think was the highest at 69 yeah. So remember what I've told you over the years, I've been saying this for at least 12 years, every 1% decline in the home ownership rate is about 1 million new renters. Yep. Correct. Roughly. Yep. Think about that. 1 yeah. million new renters with no new inventory of properties. What does that do to rents? They can only go up.
either that or we got to build a lot more apartments. I mean, the people are talking about apartments being you, people have to down select. Yeah. Right. They're, they're going to have to trade a house for an apartment. Yep. And that's cheaper. I spend a lot of time with single family. I own apartments as well, but single family rents are still strong. People want space. They want a backyard. They want a garage for their stuff. If demand keeps going up, like we've talked about, rents are going to go up and the people that can't afford it will go to apartments. They will down select. The only way to fix this is to make it easier and cheaper to build more houses. It's That's a supply it. problem, not a demand problem. Supply yeah, problem. It's a huge supply problem. Or maybe you, you know, tell everybody they got to take some new medicine, which lowers the population. <laughs> That's <laughs> scary. Yeah. Not well, good. actually, wait, they did that already. <laughs> yeah. yeah, this is just this is just a giant problem that I, I don't see a fix for it. Now, you know, think our home state for both of us, uh, California. They've done a couple of things that are interesting. You know, they made it really easy for people to add accessory dwelling units to their houses. Yep. I'm sure you know Correct. about this. I, absolutely. Um, and more recently, they just passed another law allowing people to sell those separately yep. as if they Correct. were like a two unit R2, mm -hmm. like a duplex property or a condo. Mm -hmm. But interestingly, this doesn't really solve the problem. And I'll tell you why, because the ADUs can cost around $500 a square foot to build. I mean, mm -hmm. you add land to that and you've got a $700,000 little tiny, tiny house in the backyard. I mean, that doesn't work. That doesn't solve the problem. It's going to help at the margins. I think adding more units helps at the margins. Uh, it's going to be really good for, for, you know, for the baby boomers who bought their houses in the 70s and 80s to get income. Um, it'll help with the margins, but it's not the fix. But but you know, it's it's not a bad thing. It's it's a nice attempt. Yeah. No, I I mean I agree that it it'll create just a tiny bit of pressure release on the housing mm -hmm. affordability problem. But again, unless you can allow people to build those cheaper, correct? That that off the shelf. Point. Yeah. Or Bring there's some yep. disruptive yep. technology that makes it. And then I know I'm going to get a million emails that say, well, Jason, have you heard of Boxable? Do you know about yeah. 3D printed homes? Yes, we've done shows on all of this, folks. Do you know yeah. you can buy a house on Amazon? <laughs> yeah, I know that too. I've done a video yeah. on that. None of these things work. They're much more expensive than you think they are. By the time you engineer them and everything, you're yep. at least 250 a square foot without land. No at land least. included. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I just did a show with the ADU expert and, and doesn't recommend boxable or any of that stuff. Cause it does, it's hard to get a certificate of occupancy. Oh, tell me about that. Well, basically they're not on foundations. You have to run plumbing and all of that to them. They're also not engineered to the local building specs. That's why it hasn't taken off because every building department has their own thing. The first person to solve it, like if you solve it for my market of Fresno, California, that doesn't mean it's approved in LA. It doesn't mean yeah. it's proved in Vegas. Right. Everybody has their own required. That's why it's not rinse and repeat. That's why Fresno, California has five approved plans that you can go get for a couple hundred bucks and build. They're trying to solve it with approved plans. You know, uh -huh. you, you can't just buy a boxable or a Home Depot or whatever because you can't get a certificate of occupancy. But all of that go buy those plans and, and build is building a traditional stick built house. Correct. It and saves, it's super expensive to do that. Yeah, it's, it, it uh, streamlines the process. So you get it done three months sooner than going mm -hmm. through architectural review because you just get a rubber stamp. You save yeah. about 10000 bucks in architecture and permit fees because they're right. trying to encourage these. So it's a little cheaper and a lot faster. Yeah. Yeah. But still, it's not cheap enough. It's not, not cheap no, I agree. Enough not cheap enough. enough. Not, and, no. and what are the sizes of those houses? I mean, they're just tiny. They're tiny. I think this. I think the small end's four hundred eighty square feet. The big one's eight hundred eighty square feet. Yeah. So if you think the first time buyer entry housing program for a couple with a kid or two is a four hundred square foot mm -hmm. house, <laughs> you know, I, thought... no. I I think it helps generational living. Like yeah. Right. Mom, that's what I think it helps with. Yeah, it, it could keep mom and dad out of an assisted living house. That's the goal. I that's, that's what it how do. I see it. Yes. Oh, right. Right. Very interesting. Or it makes a good place for your teenagers to, you know, do drugs or, <laughs> or have well, sex. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. yeah. So, Michael, 
what other things do you want to share with us, either from your your research here on your on your spreadsheet or just in general? I think at the end of the day, we have to realize that affordability is is near a record low for everybody that wants to know. Nineteen eighty one is the record low. Nineteen eighty one is the worst uh, affordability in, since nineteen seventy. The unfortunate part is we could be here a while. I think the only answer to fixing the housing market today is time. You need time for wages to increase. You need time for the Fed to stop higher for longer. The housing market will be broken for five to 10 years is my conclusion. And do you say that, uh, you know, like what's your prediction on what will happen? Do you see a Fed pivot happening? And if so, approximately when? Well, it depends on what you call a pivot. I actually think the Fed pivoted last Sunday and they went from being the big bad wolf saying higher for longer to, oh my God, the market's doing our job for us. We're done. So November rate hike, uh, no December rate hike. I think the Fed's on pause for the next 12 months or so. So that is the Fed pivot to me. If you're asking for a rate cut, I think they're going to hold on with all their might till 2025. I don't know that they can. Stuff appears to be breaking. The bond vigilantes are back. If you gave them true serum, they're they're talking Q1 of 25 before they cut. It's my my guess. I don't know if they, I don't know if they're going to be able to hold on that long. Yeah. Okay. All right. What else do you want people to know? Real estate investing is never easy. The last couple of years, there's been a lot of financial engineers who got lucky, and uh, they're going to get hurt in a big way. Uh, but real estate investing is still the tried and true way for average folks like myself and Jason to get wealthy. You've seen there is a path. And everybody just one listening at a time. and watching. Yeah, and everybody listening. Just one at a time. You don't need 100. You don't need 50. I think if you get to four, you change your life. And if you choose to get to 10, you know that's great. Yeah. Yeah, you know, that's such a good point. Just getting started and getting that one rental, if you already own a few, you know, depending on your income and your situation, if you can get two more per year, I mean, you change your life at four, okay, and then you really change your life at 10. And beyond that, you're just, you're getting- You're playing with house money. A a fantastic level of, of, um, yeah, where your properties begin buying your properties for you. It becomes the, what they tried to invent many years ago, the perpetual motion machine. (laughs) That's that's really what it becomes. Yeah. Any techniques or advice you want to share other than, you know, we've talked about the market. We've talked about our, our thoughts, our predictions, but specific advice. Yeah. So I will tell you, I'm always telling people what I'm doing. So there's a variable that I'm looking at today that he's an offer. And I've never used this variable before in 22 years. It is quite simply days on market. In my market, I don't write an offer unless the property has been on the market for 30 days or greater. I want to know that that seller is not getting the price, not getting the terms or, or whatnot. And I'll even wait sometimes for 60 days. I'm writing what I call disrespectful offers, aggressive offers on properties that are aged out 30 to 60 days. I don't need to buy every property. I need to buy one or two a year. And I'm going to write offers that that produce great deals today. And to, today, my metric is days on market. I've never used it before. I've always tracked it, but never used it. It is the metric that I'm using today. Mm-hmm. And, and what about where the rubber meets the road? And that's on management. Any tips on property management? Are you self-managing all your properties? No, no I've had a property manager at day one. My market's two and a half hours away uh, from my you know, California house. It's you know seven hours away from my Vegas house. I've paid someone. Property management's a hard business. I fired my first five. I like to work with somebody whose owner or principal is an investor. That seems to work very well for me. They put in the systems and teams to help with that. So um, that's what's worked for me. But no, I don't manage my own stuff. I, I would never do that. I don't want to. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So that's interesting. I would I would have sort of picked you as a self manager using the hybrid self management approach like I do. I love self management. I'm a huge fan. It's amazing. I mean, I really just never talk to my tenants. But what's interesting about what you said is that you went through five property managers that you fired before you got one that you liked. Oh that's, yeah. Uh, yeah, property management is hard. It's a hard business. Expectation management. I have high expectations. Communication. You can't be run over by the tenants. It's, it's tough. So I have a Friday call for 15 minutes every week with my contact. Uh, okay. We go through a list of reports. Mm-hmm. I spend about four hours a month on our portfolio. Mm-hmm. And uh, that allows me to do lots of other things. Gladly okay. pay it. Good for you. All right. Well, Michael, give out your website and tell people where they can learn more. 
one rental at a time. I'm very good at everything I do is one rental at a time. Website, YouTube, books, all the all the above. But Jason, again, thank you for all you do. You've been doing this for so long. I've been following you for a long time. Thanks for the opportunity. Hey, thank you. It's great having you on the show, buddy. And we will talk to you soon. 